Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 77 of our Planet Zoom Mod Spotlight, so we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making, and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that surrounds us in our world, so I'm quite excited to get stuck into this slot, this is my second attempt recording it, because I've been having computer issues, but hopefully this one uh, goes through without a hitch, but um, I'm really, really awesome to show a lot of these cool new mods and all that. Very interesting species to show off today. So first, we're going to be starting off with uh, a couple fish mods from uh, Gaboy Buffsu and Genora Pizza. So we're going to be starting off first with the Mekong, uh, not Mekong catfish, the um, Char Piranha or pa Piranha uh, catfish, or also giant catfish, also known as the Paroon Shark. We'll go with the Paroon Shark just as the best example, but we're going to have a look at these wonderful guys. So this is the, as I mentioned, the um, Paroon Shark. Not to be confused with the Mekong catfish, but they live in similar areas. These guys are found in uh, the Mekong and Chalpara rivers, though I've been actually introduced to in um, Central Antolia, South Africa, and Malaysia as well. So they've been introduced in some areas. Um, these are a member of the shark catfish family, or called um, Pangsalidae in the order Suluriformes, so they're a type of catfish kind of uh, group. And these guys are really cool species. They live in uh, tolerant uh, and cold and poor water quality, so they type kind of like those areas, uh, poor water quality and quite tolerant. And they tend to live at the bottom of deep depressions and freshwater rivers. And these fish live in these rivers, but they are endangered in uh, endangerment because of people building dams, uh, which makes these fish trapped and they're unable to migrate. So, in terms of their physical characteristics, you can see here, we've got these really interesting um, melana, uh, melanophores that they have, where they have this, like, dusky look to them. And they have this wide, flat, whiskered head with these, obviously, with these whiskers. And um, they can get pretty big. They have the silvery grey colour here, and it looks really, really nice. Um, you can see the kind of counter shading that they have here that helps in their habitat, especially since they're predators. And, um... They can get quite large. Full-grown uh, full adults can reach about 300 centimeters or 9.8 feet from uh, snout, to vent, uh, snout length or total length. Uh, and they can weigh up to 300 kilograms or 660 pounds. That they most commonly reach about 2 meters or so. So these guys are probably going for some food. Uh, we'll watch these guys go up and do their thing. Hopefully there's another one swimming around later. But uh, we'll have a look here. These guys reproduce sexually, and the eggs and sperm is usually released in muddy areas of this uh, water to prevent the eggs from sticking to each other. And the number of the eggs per, uh, per each spawning is about 600, with a diameter that's 2.5 two millimeters. And the broods show low genetic variation, and there is no actually no parental care while spawning as well. So in terms of behavior, these guys are bethnopelagic, so that means they like open deep water. And juveniles, adults, uh, typically feed on crustaceans and fish and uh, shrimps, uh, things like that. And they've also been known to feed on large, larger animal carcasses. And these guys typically spawn just prior to that monsoon season. And it's believed that these guys uh, will prey on their shrimp, stuff like that, from deep areas and hideouts in the rivers. And they have a seasonal migration, but they do not actually leave the river during this migration. And they only stay within the river during this migration. They kind of leave off and do their own thing. So let's have a look at you while you're swimming off. Really, really interesting. So part of the reason why they're so endangered is because they kind of, we don't know their longevity and they kind of grow fast, die young. So they grow fast, um, live fast, die young is probably the best way to say it. And um, as a possible reason is the fact that the overfishing of the species as well, they could potentially be longer lived because we really just don't see that many mature individuals, sadly. And in terms of the economic importance, um, the uh, important to humans use the neck of knowledge we have about it, and the fish can show us migratory patterns and spawning habits. And the fish also has an important role in fisheries, as they are fast-growing and can live in poor water. And plus, they uh, bring in good prices for a fish uh, in this fish. So that's another interesting uh, little tidbit about them. And in terms of their relationship to humans, fishing for the species is used to be accompanied by religious ceremonies and stuff like that. And um, they sometimes appear in the hobby as aquarium fish, though they do not reach their full size unless they're in an extremely large pond or aquarium. And um, in terms of their conservation status, they are considered critically endangered, sadly, because of this over-harvesting, also the damming of rivers and pollution. And there have been breeding uh, 
practice trying to help the population and are protected uh, totally by the governments of like uh, Thailand and things like that. And it's recommended that for their conservation that harvesting these guys are halted so they will be able to replenish their numbers and um, they can be sustainably used when their numbers reach a sustainable level. So really, really awesome fish. As I mentioned, also done by good boy um, uh, Buff Sue and General Pizza. Really, really cool fish. Next, we're moving on to another one done by the Save Animals. We've got uh, by the same people. We've got the Kaluga Sturgeon. So a really interesting animal here. So the Kaluga Sturgeon, also just known as the River Beluga or just the Kaluga. Um, these guys are a very large predatory stu uh, sturgeon that are found in the Amur River Basin. And um, these guys are semi-androgynous. That means they spend some of their life in salt water, but they will spend most of their life in fresh water. So they're one of the four species of sturgeon that live in the Amur River. And the Amur River is a very large river that lives, uh, that is found around East China and is, lies between the border of uh, China and Russia. And these guys will spawn in the mainstream of the river, while others will stream, uh, spawn downstream. And they prefer the point of the river where it's illuminated while bottom, uh, white bottom and the open spaces where they can swim along the bottom of the river. And the observations show that these guys might do this to avoid kind of the predators near the bottom of the river. And they're currently considered endangered because of human interaction. However, lots of environmental factors such as warm water temperatures uh, pose a risk because of fungi and um, things like that. And um, migration also plays a big role in their early life. So the migration of the Kaluga is considered a passive movement as the embryos kind of have no control. And the generation length for the species is no less than 20 years, so that's actually quite comparable to humans. So they have a very slow regeneration time. And look at these huge fish, really, really awesome. So we're going to talk about their life cycle uh, while we have a look at this cute little baby. So in terms of their life cycle, they spend at least part of their life in salt water and then return to rivers to breed. So the Kaluga surgeon spawns in the lower reach of the Amur um, River are kind of a strong current. And they have, the river has kind of gravelly and savile, uh, sandy gravel bottom of the water, which is typically between 12 and 20 degrees, or about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And about 6 to 10 feet deep, or about 2 to 3 meters. With this guys, these guys spawning peaks around end of May to July, and adults will uh, spawn many times during their life cycle. And spawning happens periodically for about four, every four to five years for females, and three to four for males. And water temperatures... Um, affect the onset of maturity in females so females spawn a year earlier during warm years than they would during a cold year so that's also very interesting so um population uh, they've had some sharp declines so uh in 1881 there was 595 tons of kaluga sturgeon harvested in that year and it's gone down to 61 tons in 1948 and 89 tons in 1996 so this indicates there's been a greatly uh, 80 percent dec uh, decrease in the catches over that 90 year period and um, since uh, 2000, these uh, surgeons older than 10 years old have not been observed in the Amur River uh, during non-spawning periods. So just the adults in the Amur River are absent. So they're almost like extinct in that area uh, in terms of adults. So let's have a look at the adults while we talk about them. Really big fish, aren't they beautiful? So um, as you mentioned, these, these guys are a huge fish, as they're also known as the River Beluga, where they have this triangular head and these roundish plates around here that really gives them a unique look. Um, they also have these uh, rituals and around here and uh, all the scoots uh, done the ventral and um, lateral sides, as you can see here. And they have an extremely large mouth that they use to catch prey with and these bristles that allow them to feel around as well, with these small eyes and these large uh, gill rakers as well. And they can get huge. Their size is about less, uh, at least a thousand kilograms or about 2,205 pounds and 5.6 meters or 18.6 feet long. And they're actually one of the largest sturgeons uh, in the sturgeon family. And the only one that really beats them is the slightly larger uh, beluga sturgeon, uh, which is very interesting. And these guys will feed on all sorts of uh, mid-sized animals. So they'll eat um, kind of pike, carp, herrings, keta, shellfish, pretty much anything they can fit in their mouths. And they can live up for to 55 years. So they're quite a long lived fish which makes their generation times a bit uh, rough there, as you can see. So as I mentioned, the main reason for the decline is poaching and people hunting them for their row. And this and the slow generation time doesn't really help as well, as one adult is a really big hit to the population, so it takes more time to recover. 
and the animals being hunted down for their unfertilized eggs because sturgeon roe is considered a de delicacy, and that's obviously very bad. But luckily, there have been lots of agreements to protect these guys, so they're basically considered uh, absolutely protected under the law. And um, they're, though they're not currently uh, threatened with extinction, uh, they are um, potentially could be without trade control, so there's very limited control on these guys and having specimens, so permits, things like that. And, um, yeah, it's very, very uh, sad that these guys have obviously got to a point where they are endangered, but they look like they're starting to make their way on the up and up now. So, really, um, we should be taking care of these guys because they're such interesting large fish. And, again, these guys were also done by um, Kaboy, uh, Buff Su, and General Pizza, so another really awesome fish. And next, we're moving on to another fish here. Uh, this one is an ocean fish and was just done by uh, Buff Su, uh, Jen, and um buffsu gin and genoa pizza we have got the atlantic um opo which is a very uh opa i believe you say is a really interesting fish as you can see they're quite a large uh deep sea fish so um these are pelagic fish that can be found worldwide but this particular species i believe really only lives in the north atlantic so this is kind of the north atlantic species and um these guys, as you can see, they're like a very large disc. They're kind of similar to the sunfish, and but they're not related to the oceanic sunfish very much. But you can see they can get uh, quite uh, tall or laterally compressed, and they have these red fins and this really nice pattern on their body with uh, uh, dots that almost look like stars. Really, really interesting fish there. So let's see if you can find one that's swimming around in the water. There we are. Oh, that's a juvenile. Have a look at the adults. So, um, as you can see, they kind of got that red around their fins as well, and really nice patterning. And then you're quite huge. They can reach a maximum length of about 2 meters, or 6 foot 6 in length, and weigh about 270 kilograms, or 600 pounds. And one thing that really sets them apart from a lot of other fish um, is that they have endothermy. So, they have been shown to maintain its entire body temperature uh, above the ambient temperature of the water. So they're the first known fish with whole body endothermy, while other fish have been known to have uh, partial endothermy or like regional endothermy, so like their brain or their organs, for example, that's where they kind of have that. And that's due to them having kind of, um, they use their very powerful pectoral muscles uh, to help them swim, and that generates heat where they have a lot of insulating fat and other specialized organs that allow them to trap that heat in that body. So basically they just move their fins and that allows their body to heat up and allows them to maintain their body temperature slightly warmer than the environment, up to about five degrees. And also what it really helps is that in this improves this performance by having like large gills, uh, large muscles and things like that to really help that. And it's a really nice adaption since it helps them uh, escape predators and also allow them to better feed in colder waters. So that's also awesome. And um, you can see their mouth there. They've got mostly small teeth that are pretty much toothless. And they have the lateral line, as you can see, they've got that high arch around there that really makes it look interesting. So as I mentioned, these guys have a pretty huge uh, distribution. Uh, these guys have been found, well, not this particular species, because that's uh, kind of a taxonomic debate, but they can be found from Argentina in the Atlantic, uh, Norway, Senegal, and, and the Southern Ocean, so they're pretty much all over the world. And they would live, spend their entire life out in the, it was presumed that they spend their entire life out in the um, open ocean. And uh, while well, they possibly will be found in the bathnopelagic zone, so quite deep, uh, they're typically found within waters of 8 to 22 degrees. And the best understanding, um, our glutalis tends to inhabit trip, uh, tropical and temperate open waters uh, throughout the central North Pacific, all that. And very interesting. And this adaption that they have for the endophony allows them to really um, live in these cool depths and also uh, higher latitudes, which is really interesting. And their life history is very uncertain, but they swim, use their pectoral fins, which really helps them uh, move around. And they swim around at like a consistently low speed, a slow speed, and they're able to swim about 65, uh, 25 centimeters a second, and even 4 meters a second in short bursts. And like any other large pelagic uh, visual predators, they will exhibit like vertical behavior. And 
they will eat like squid and krill that makes a bulk of their diet also small fish and they probably spawn in the spring and with their planktonic larvae lacking these fins and they undergo a really marked transformation from being slender to these deep body forms that you see here so a really really interesting fish and i'm a big fan of these guys so genora pizza jen and buffs you did a wonderful job with these guys but now we're moving on to the chilean devil rain another really interesting guy here so these guys are a close relative of the manta rays and they're not too different in terms of their ecology they're giant filter feeders that fly around and uh, in the water and all like that and they have been observed often worldwide basking just below the surface maybe and mainly offshore but occasionally the coast and these guys can get quite big they can get to about uh, a disc length of about 12 feet long or 3.7 meters so quite big let's see you swimming over there beautiful animals so um, these were originally believed to be surface dwellers but we actually discovered they can dive up to depths of um, 1896 meters or 6220 feet during these deep dives to feed which makes them among the most deepest living uh, deepest diving ocean animals that's really interesting um, they drive often through a steepwood pa uh, stepwood pattern down into the as they dive deep and rapidly and then they kind of come up and level come up and level as they come up and forage so it's very interesting and these guys also will display two distinct deep dive patterns with a stepwise pattern that we mentioned before that usually occurs once every 24 hours involving diving to that maximum depth and then resurfacing after 60 90 minutes and and the second pattern which is less frequent is that they will dive up to a thousand meters deep for a maximum of 11 hours and this latter pattern has been associated with traveling a lot more than feeding. So um, it's believed that this way uh, is possible because they uh, have an organ called the reticular um, mirabilia, which is found in rays and deep diving great white sharks. So this is a vein structure in the blood vessels that warms the ray's brain during the uh, cool, when it's uh, swimming around at the cooler depths. And they typically stay near their water, wa uh, warm wa surface water to bask and, um, for at least an hour before they dive, suggesting that they are soaking up the heat to prepare their body to recover as they dive deep, because it can get quite cold down there in their endotherms, uh, ectotherms, I mean, so they've got to be careful with um, getting too cold. But yeah, really, really wonderful species. I'm a big fan of these guys. So... We're moving on to the biggest ray. As I mentioned, these guys are about three meters long. We've got the big seven meter long uh, or seven meter wide greater um, giant manta ray. So really, really beautiful. Let's see if you got one swimming around. Uh, there's not one swimming around at the moment. But um, these are so beautiful. Is this a juvenile? Yeah, that's a juvenile. But um, yeah, so got, this one's probably going to go to the water, hopefully. Yeah, really, really wonderful species here. I think we'll just speed it up a little bit. Let's see if these guys will go in the water. Come on, do it for me. Um, they're based on the penguin as well, so that's also really awesome. So they're now able to properly swim. But this guy's going for a swim over there. Come on, do it for me. Uh, we'll talk about them anyway. So this is the uh, giant oceanic manta ray, which has been split from the kind of that reef uh, giant manta. But these guys are a really interesting species as they are the kind of the largest species of ray in the world. And uh, they can be found pretty much circumpolar. So they're literally be found almost anywhere in the world uh, in temperate or tropical waters and um, these guys can reach a length of up to nine meters long with a disc length of about seven meters and they can weigh up to three thousand kilograms or three tons or six hundred six thousand six hundred pounds uh, but they typically are about four and a half meters or 15 feet those are kind of the average size for the individuals and you can see, very similar to the Devil Ray, they f uh, fly around in water with these large wings, and they have these large mouths that allow them to filter, as well as these large gill rakers that filter water out, and then they are able to filter plankton and things like that in. So, um, yeah, these guys can be found pretty much all over the world, from uh, pretty much Egypt to Japan 
to the Azores, to Uruguay, to South Africa, to New Zealand, where they are an ocean-going species that live out on the open ocean, where they travel with the currents and migrate areas uh, to areas where there's upwellings of nutrient-rich water that attract uh, zooplankton, which these guys feed on. And um, there are a few aquariums that have had these guys, such as the Okinawa um, Aquarium and the Marine Life Park in Singapore, things like that. But um, in terms of ecology, these guys uh, travel deep water. They also often swim in a straight line, uh, while when they're further inshore, they usually bask or swim a little bit more idly. They either travel alone or in groups of up to 50 individuals and often associate with other species, such as marine mammals and seabirds. And about 20% of their diet is based on filter feeding, and they will migrate to coastlines to hunt for various types of zooplankton, such as copepods, shrimp, uh, decapod larvae, things like that, and even varying types of fish. And when foraging, they usually swim slowly towards their prey, where they herd the bactonic creatures in a tight group, where they will often come and then uh, filter them with their mouths and go through there. As many as uh, 50 individual fish may gather at these single plankton-rich uh, feeding sites, and um, recent evidence also suggests that the 73% of their diet is uh, mesopelagic and deep water, which includes fish. So early assumptions include assumed that these guys were exclusively filter feeders, but these guys do eat a lot of fish. Um, the giant, as you can see, these guys uh, sometimes will often visit uh, cleaning stations where fish like cleaning rafts will go over them and kind of clean off parasites as well. And um, they usually only do this during high tide as that they do not rest on the seabed like a lot of fish as they need to constantly be pumping water through their gills to uh, survive. And these guys typically reach sexual maturity when the disc is about 4 meters long or 4 meters or about 30 feet. Well, females need to be about 5 meters or 16 feet long to breed. Once a female comes receptive, uh, one or several males will follow her in a train and then they'll copulate. And then he'll assert his clasp as you know how that happens. And the fertilized egg will develop in the female's overduct and they will be enclosed in an egg case. So the developing airing area will feed on the yolk. And after the eggs hatches, uh, the pup will remain in the overduct and will receive nourishment nourishment from a uterine milk or a milky secretion that these guys will um, uh, give to their babies they do not have a placental connection with their mother and the pup relies on the pumping to obtain oxygen uh, from their gills and the brood size is typically uh, one but occasionally two can be developed and um, the gestation period is thought to be 12 to 13 months uh, and when fully developed the pup is about 1.4 meters or 4 foot 7 in disc width and they weigh about 9 kilograms, and they kind of resemble the adult, where they are kind of born, and then they remain near the coast in a shallow water environment until they are old enough and big enough to survive the open oceans. Let's see if we can find one swimming around there. Oh, you're all going to come up to land. Anyway, they also have the largest brains of any fish, and they actually have a brain that's up to 200 grams, which is actually 5 to 10 times larger than the brain of a whale shark. And they're also one of the only fish that have passed... Uh, the uh, mirror test, which indicates that these guys may actually have some pretty sophisticated self-awareness. And um, in terms of their conservation, these guys uh, don't have that many predators, other things like killer whales, uh, bull sharks, false killer whales, things like that may eat them. But they are considered endangered because of overfishing, because these guys breed so slow they can't really com uh, keep up with any type of serious fishing. There's also the fact that these guys are... Um, sensitive to pollution such as microplastics which gets accumulated in their tissues which can often be very very bad for them and also climate change is also a big issue because when rhyming tip when the temperatures rise it's projected that many as 10 percent of the world's phytoplankton will decrease and potentially 50 percent in these uh tropical areas which means that this would reduce the amount of food that these uh manta rays have to eat which is very sad but they are only just considered endangered so there's still a lot of them around and really beautiful animals we just can't let them go extinct they're just too beautiful but now we're going to be moving on to a bird so this one was done by buff su genora pizza same with the uh, chilean devil rain now we've got one by leaf everyone's favorite we have got the greater raya so these guys are a species of flightless bird that are native to east and southern america and other names are also known as the American rare or the common rare, things like that. And um, these guys are native to Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, and Uruguay, where they live in a, all sorts of different habitats, such as grasslands, savannas, and uh, grassy wetlands. And they're actually the largest native bird to South America as well. That's another cool little fact. And the population has actually established themselves in northern Germany. 
So in terms of size, an adult can get about 20 to 27 kilograms or 44 to 60 pounds and often measure 127 to 140 centimeters, 50 to 55 inches from beak to tail, while they usually stand at about 1.5 meters or 4 foot 11 um, tall. A typical range is between 1.4 to 1.7 meters or 4 foot 7 to 5 foot 7, so can get quite tall, pretty big birds. And a big maximum weight is probably about 23 kilograms, so there have been some that have been estimated to be up to 30 kilograms. Uh, with large males being up to 40 kilograms and nearly standing six foot tall, but this is considered to be uncommon. Um, as I mentioned, these guys kind of live in Uruguay um, in all these kind of open habitats uh, like savannas, deserts, pastur uh, pastoral land, things like that, or areas that are quite heavily farmed. So let's have another is a look at you. Wonderful big birds. This is a big male here. So these guys are a silent bird except during the mating season where they make lots of big booming calls. And during the non-breeding season, they will flock in uh, groups between 10 and 100 birds. And when in these uh, flocks, they tend to be less vigilant, but the males can be aggressive to each other. And then chase, they will flee in a zigzag pattern, trying to get away from these guys. And in terms of their feeding and diet, these guys are pretty generalist. They typically feed on foliage, such as seeds and fruits, but they mainly feed also feed on insects, such as scorpions, fish, small rodents, uh, scorpions and small insects, all those little guys there. And they're actually often um, swallow pebbles as well as this helps break up their food. So they eat these gastroliths. And um, they actually, lots of farmers like them because they will um, not eat cereals or eucalyptus trees. So these guys can be quite beneficial to farmers as they kind of will go in and control the numbers of small invertebrates and things like that. And they also be known to eat like bees and stuff, although they can give quite painful skins, uh, skins, uh, stings. They don't really care. And uh, they've also been known to eat dead or dying fish and vertebrate prey, but not in large quantities and also carrying things like that. And in terms of reproduction, these large males are kind of take the brunt of the care. So in during the winter, they will form groups of single males, flocks of about two to 15 females and large flocks of yearlings. So what happens is that the males will get aggressive to each other and start courting the females as well. And then the female will come and um, lay her eggs for this male. Uh, the male will typically be on the nest and act aggressive to when approaching by the female. And the males are simultaneously polygam uh, polygamous, and the females are sim uh, serially polyandrous. So it means the females during the breeding season will mate with uh, a male and deposit their eggs with the male uh, before leaving and mating with another male. And males, on the other hand, will kind of take care of all the incubation and the hatchlings on their own. And actually, uh, recent evidence suggest suggests that... Um, Often, they will uh, get help as uh, some males will utilize subordinate males to help incubate and protect the eggs. And if this happens, this dominant male will find a second harem and start the process over again. And these nests can uh, often collectively, because they use several females to lay them, they can be as many as 80 eggs laid by a dozen females. Though each individual female's clutch is about 5 to 10 eggs, though on average clutch size is about 26 eggs laid by a bunch of different females. So, um, have a look at the females while we talk about them. So, in t oh, that's the male. We want to talk about the female. But in terms of their eggs, uh, they measure about 130 millimeters to 90 millimeters and about 600 grams or about 5.1 inches to 3.5 inches and about 21 ounces, which is about less than half than an ostrich egg that are greenish yellow that kind of hide in the grass. And um, in terms of the incubation period, we'll have a look at the babies. Uh, where's the babies? Where's the babies? There's the babies. So in terms of their incubation period, uh, it tends to last about 40, uh, 29 to 43 days, and all eggs will hatch uh, between 36 hours of each other. And these guys will create, when they hatch, they will uh, make a call that resembles like even fireworks, even while inside the egg, that where the hatching time is often coordinated. And they typically reach about half growth in about three months after hatching, and they reach their sexual maturity on their 14th month, so a little over a year. So in terms of their predators, they're typically pretty safe because of their size, but they are often preyed upon by cougars, uh, jaguars, um, certain types of birds. Armadillos have been known to eat their eggs as well, though they have been, uh, interestingly, captive bred rays are quite ecologically naive, so that means their fearlessness kind of makes them vulnerable to predators, so there needs to be conditioning to make sure that these guys don't get too familiar as well. 
So that's why introductions have kind of been issues sometimes. And in terms of their status and conservation, uh, these guys are considered near threatened. They're very common. So they're basically found in a large area, but their populations are believed to increase because of hunting and the conversion of grasslands to farmland and ranchlands. But um, sometimes they consider these guys pests. Sometimes they can be beneficial. And these guys have hunted a bit too, which has really contributed to their decline. And they really need that kind of... Uh, open habitat to survive and so they actually have a very interesting relationship to humans so um the ancient humans of the P patagonia region actually created stencils of these guys during the early early holocene so about ten thousand years ago or so and they can be found on rock art so that's also really really cool big fan of these guys so next we're going to be moving on to uh, that was done by leaf as well we've got another couple done by leaf we have got here the south american kawati a uh, very interesting little guy here. Oh, now you're going to mess that up. Please don't do that. So this is the South American Kwadi, a cute guy here. So also known as the ring-tailed Kwadi, uh, these are a species that belong to the raccoon family and can be found in South America in both tropical and subtropical areas. An adult typically gets between 2 and 7.2 kilograms or 4.4 to 15.9 pounds and about 85 to 113 centimeters or about 33 to 44 inches with half of that pretty much being its long tail which is highly variable when color and sometimes they can have these long stripes and um yeah really really cool uh as i mentioned these guys are pretty much found across south america and uh, they can be found uh from the andes to northern argentina and they've been recorded in ecuador as well and um they're often banned in the um you um Europe because they can be considered an invasive species and they could get out and obviously breed so you're not allowed to have them but in terms of their uh, behavior these guys are diurnal so they hunt during the day and they live both in the ground and trees where they're omnivores so they'll feed on insects uh, other invertebrates bird eggs small animals and fruits where they spend their time in the tr uh, trees hunting for fruits and they'll often poke their snouts and cavers, uh, crevices and stuff like that to try and um find little things to eat obviously of course and females will typically live in these large groups called bands which consists of about 15 to 30 animals and males are usually uh solitary and solitary males are actually originally called considered a separate species and they were called kawati Mund mundis which is a term that's actually still used today but they're not a different species they're just the lone males which is uh very very funny in my opinion let's see if these guys will any of them will climb but um anyway these guys also uh, defend unique territory and they often overlap. And group members will often uh, produce a soft whistling and a whining sound. But alarm calls can be different and can be woofs and ha uh, ha clicks, which uh, allows uh, alerts them to predators. And Kuatis typically sleep in the trees. And when alarm claw is sounded, they will climb uh, the trees and then drop down to the ground and disperse. And the predators of these guys include foxes, jaguars, jackal mundis, and occasionally humans. And in terms of the reproduction, all females in a group will go into heat simultaneously and will mate with lots of males. The gestation period is generally about 74 to 77 days, with uh, captive females giving birth to about 1 to 7 young at a time. Um, and in the wild, they leave their group uh, for giving birth in the nest and that's built in the trees. And then they rejoin their group about six to eight, five to six weeks later. And um, they usually, females will usually remain in their natal group where males will disperse from their natal group or the group they're born into at about three years of age. And um, South American Kuwaitis tend to live seven years in the wild, but 14 years in captivity. So yeah, and they also considered least concerned because they're quite adaptable, so that lends them a lot of ability to adapt and survive. Yeah, really wonderful species. And this was also done by Leaf, and this next one was also done by Leaf. We have got the white-nosed Kuwati, which is kind of the northern relative of these guys. Really, really beautiful species, if I do say so myself. So this is the white-nosed Kuwati, also known as Kuwati Mundi. Uh, these guys are kind of similar sizes. Uh, they weigh about 4 to 6 kilograms, or 8 to 13 pounds, with, however, males getting up to 2 and a half, uh, 12 kilograms, or 27 pounds, and females as little as 2 and a half kilograms, or 5.5 pounds. And these guys are about 110 centimeters, or about 3.6 feet long, with half of that length being their long tails, as you can kind of see here. So... Um, these guys, in comparison to the South American Kuwaitis, these guys are much more northerly. These can be found basically around New Mexico and Central America, 
and there's actually a species uh, subspecies found on the Kamunsu Island, which was often treated as a separate species, but now is often considered just a subspecies. And they've actually been a population introduced into Florida. They could have been basically, they don't really know how that happened. It's basically either escaped captives, which has been um, documented. And there's often been talks of potentially uh, some coming over from rafts and things like that, which is also very interesting. But um, they're not too different from their uh, cousins in terms of their habits. So they are omnivores and uh, feed them pretty much anything like that and live in these groups. And actually, they're actually... Uh, Known popu uh, pollinators of the balsa tree, which was observed in a study of these guys in Costa Rica. So they insert their nose into the flowers of the tree and then in ingest the nectar. And it shows that there's not much damage to this. And the pollen from the flower covers the face of these guys. So when they go look for another flower, all the pollen gets in and that obviously mixes the genetic... Uh, uh, genetics of the plant so that really helps pollinate them so that's really really cool and scientists have actually observed this uh, dependent relationship on these guys and they both provide it's a mutualistic relationship so the uh critical uh nutrition and hydration from the coates also um um obviously helps them obviously survive and then the pollen they help with pollinating the plants so that's a mutualistic relationship and um which is also very very interesting and as i mentioned their feeding habitat uh, habits they're just like the northern version of their cousins they look slightly different but not too different in their habits they're omnivore so they'll eat hang out in the trees and forage mostly on the ground so they'll feed on insects carrion uh eggs fruits pretty much everything they can get their mouths around and they're pretty good climbers so they can climb around trees and balance pretty easily so um yeah that was also done by leaf but i got to say last but most definitely not least, we've got a wonderful mod done by Narwhaler. We have got the Wild Yak. So a wonderful big animal here. This is our big male here. So the Wild Yak is a large wild cattle uh, or um, cow species native to the Himalayas and the ancestor of the domestic yak. Uh, these guys are among one of the largest living bovids. They can actually stand at about 1.6 to 2.05 meters tall, so between 5 foot 2 and 6 foot 7, and that's about at the shoulder, and they weigh between 500 and 1200 kilograms, or 1100 and 2600 pounds, with a head-to-body length of about 2.4 to 3.8 meters, or 7.9 to 12 feet, and um, females on average are about a third smaller uh, in weight, and at about 30% smaller in their dimensions with uh, domestic yaks being definitely a lot smaller. As you can see, they've got quite a bulky frame with this long hair. And actually, to protect themselves from the cold, the utters and scrotums of the females are small and actually covered by a layer of hair. And then you can see they've got these sturdy legs and cloven hooves that help them move around their uh, cold landscapes. And um, you can see they have this long shaggy hair that has a dense undercoat that's woolly to help... Um, keep them warm and then they have this long guards hairs that help keep things out such as water or um, dust and things that allow them to kind of take care of those hairs and you can see they've got a tail that's almost more similar to a horse and that really gives that long interesting look to them and there's actually uh, typically they're um, dark brown or black with a gray muzzle sometimes but there have been a population of golden yaks found and they're actually considered endangered subspecies in china with a population of no more about 170 individuals uh left in that wild and still really really interesting species so these guys used to have a very large range so they once ranged up from uh southern siberia to east of lake Baikal, but they became extinct in russia at about the 17th century and today the wild yak populations are found primarily across northern tibet and western chulong and some populations extend into uh, India as well. But small populations also found further afield. And they used to be found in Bhutan, but they're considered locally extinct. Um, the primary habitat for these guys was uh, treeless uplands between 3,000 and uh, 5,500 meters, uh, which is dominated by mountains and plateaus. And they're typically found in this alpine tundra with a thick carpet of grasses and sedges rather than the steppe country. And they actually were thought to be extinct in Nepal in the 1970s, but it were rediscovered in 2014 with the discovery making it to uh, be painted on their currency as well. So it's kind of, yeah, we got the yak back, which is pretty cool. 
So in terms of their diets, they're not too different from other cattle. They tend to feed on grasses and sedges, and they actually will feed on a smaller amount of shrubs, mosses, and even lichen. And in terms of their main predators, they have been known to be preyed upon by Himalayan wolves, black bears, brown bears, and snow leopards, uh, which likely kill young or weak yaks. Um, in the wild, they are herd animals as well. So they typically live in herds of up to 700 individuals, or several hundred individuals, although they're often much smaller. These herds will prim primarily be females and their young. And speaking of their young, here's a cute little baby. Very, very cute. So on average, the female yaks will graze 100 meters higher than the males, with females and young tending to stick to steeper slopes, uh, while the males tend to be more solitary or small groups of up to six individuals and kind of do and kind of do their own thing. And groups will often move to lower altitudes during the winter and wild yaks can actually be aggressive when defending young. They generally avoid humans and they typically try to get away from people as much as they can. And in terms of reproduction, uh, the w wild yaks will mate in the summer and give birth to a single calf that following spring. And the females will only give birth every other year, so every two years to kind of have a baby. And um, interesting in terms of the conservation, they're currently considered vulnerable, but they were considered endangered, so that's improved. Um, they were downlisted because of, uh, based on the estimated rate of population decline and their current population. Uh, population size. So the latest assessment in 2008 suggests that their population is no more than 10,000 mature individuals, which is a lot, but obviously could be more. These guys are experiencing a lot of threats from several sources. Obviously that restriction of the range and obviously being hunted from a lot of areas uh, kind of restricts their range. Um, also poaching has been a big issue. Disturbance and interbreeding with livestock is also an issue. And there may be issues of cattle-borne diseases that there's been no direct evidence this could be an issue in the future. Um, often conflicts with herders as well as um, they kind of kill um, for abductions of domestic yaks into wild herds and things like that. Though this is thought to be rare. And recent protection from poaching particularly appears to have even helped the populations increase or at least stabilize them in several areas. So that's good, which is leading to their um, downlisting in 2008. And in China and India, these guys are officially protected and there's large reserves. So they're not in the um, sight line of extinction right now, but they very well could be, especially with climate change. And hopefully we get to see more reintroduction efforts into um, Siberia and Bhutan. That would be awesome. But yeah, really wonderful species. So I think this would be a great place to end the episode. Okay, Nawala, you've done a wonderful job of that. And so did Leaf and Buff Sujin on Pizza, Gaboy. You all did a wonderful job uh, with these mods. Really did a bang up job. Also Buff Su as well. Can't forget to mention them. But I think this would be a very great place to end the video. So I really, really, really hope you guys enjoy this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye.